always, I'm privileged to be able to share the Word of God uh, today. Um, I believe I have the Word of the Lord. It's on my heart. This thing's been kind of bubbling up into me this week, and uh, I believe it's for today, and uh, I'm just glad to be able to share it. So I'm just believing God's going to continue to speak through His Word and speak to us this morning. So let's jump into it this morning. We're going to jump into uh, Psalm 133. Psalm 133, we're going to start in verse 1. We can stand for the reading of the word if you'd like to. You're there, say amen. amen. All right. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life evermore. We're going to stop there this morning. I'm going to open up with prayer today. Well, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word today, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for just the, the, your word that's able to change us, uh, to renew our minds. So I thank you, God, for just speaking to our hearts, Holy Spirit, through your word this morning, that we leave refreshed, renewed, have a different perspective of you and what your word says, God. So I just thank you for speaking to the hearts of your people today. It's going to fall on good soil. And uh, Lord, we're listening to your spirit and to your voice today, Jesus. So we just thank you this morning for your word. Speak a blessing over it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as a people of God, I'm sure most of us believe that we are called to change our community. We're called to transform our culture and to turn it upside down for, for Christ, to see people to come to Christ, to be delivered, set free, healed, filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe we are called to do that in our community outside of these four walls. I believe every one of us are called to that, that commission of, of preaching the gospel, seeing people come to Christ. I believe we're all called to this, to see the kingdom of God advance outside of these four walls, that heaven would come upon earth. And for us to do that, I, I think we can have little effect in of ourselves. We're called the spheres of influence in our personal spaces, but we can have a greater effect when we come together, united as, as one body, as, as one people. We can turn this world upside down versus just doing it by ourselves. So when we come together as a body of Christ, we have something to give. We are a part of something greater. You might be a hand. You might be a foot and the body of Christ. We all have a vital part together to advance the kingdom of God. And when we learn that we are diverse and we all have unique giftings, unique abilities, we celebrate one another, man, the sky is the limit of what we can accomplish together. What can we not do together? What can we not accomplish together with one another? And for us to do this, we cannot be divided. We've got to be united as one people with one heart, one mind, one accord, with, with one purpose, that we are together in unity with one another. We're called to unity, to live together in unity, to, to have one goal, purpose, mission, and that's to see Jesus glorified around us, the world around us, the communities around us, that we see Jesus glorified and people come to him. We've got to be in unity. And when we talk about unity, we're breaking the natural mold because by nature we're not unified people. We're not. Because we're competitive, we're, we're jealous, we're envious, we're untrusting by nature. By nature we're ununified. Just like the world, the way of the world is to be divisive. The way of the world is to be divisive. We see it through media. It builds barriers and points fingers and builds walls and, and separation and division. That's the way of the world to be divisive. We, we see it through our media outlets. It just paints these pictures to build walls and brings division among us as people. We see it through politics. We see it through being a Republican or a Democrat or Libertarian. There's all these different groups and brings division and separation in, in our world today. The way of the world is to be divisive. And not only does it happen in the secular world, but it can happen in the church world. It can happen in the body of Christ. There can be separation, division, schisms with one another. And I think that's, it happens because I, I believe that the forces of darkness understand that when we are united, we are unstoppable. You can't stop us. 
They know the forces of darkness so that when we are united as a people together, there is no stopping us. There is nothing that we cannot accomplish, that we can set out to do, that will see the glory of God manifest upon this earth. They cannot stop us, so they'll do everything they can to keep us from being united together. There's nothing that we cannot do together. I think people that walk in unity, there's nothing impossible that we cannot do. But when we're divided, we're deluded, we're, we're weakened, we're, we're ineffective when we're divided. But when we're united, there's nothing that we cannot accomplish together. And I believe when we're united, all of hell begins to shake. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to shake hell a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired of seeing people bound by the power of darkness being bound by addiction, by sickness, being bound up by the power of darkness. I want to see people set free by the power of God. I want to shake hell a little bit, set people free. I want people to come to the saving knowledge of Christ, to be delivered, healed, to walk in a greater freedom like they've never experienced before. I want to shake it a little bit. I don't know about you, but sometimes we just got to get, we got to just hate some things. We got to get passionate about some things once in a while. When just instead of sitting on the sidelines, just doing nothing about it, there should be something stirring inside of each and every one of us says, you know what? I don't like that. That is not of God. And we invade it and we invade with the kingdom of God and overtake darkness. There should be something that should be stirring in each and every one of us. I said, I just want to shake hell. I want this church to to shake hell, this community that people get set free through us. I, uh, of course, I'm a guitar player. Most of you probably know that. I I had a uh, a half stack. Um, It's an amplifier. And um, to me, it was a a 5150. That's what it was called, a PV 5150. And and, uh, I sold it. Of course, I don't have it anymore. Of course, it's kind of like my uh, cutlass to Travis. Travis, of course, loves his cutlass car, and, and uh, life's just not the same without it. But, uh, but this thing was so loud. I mean, it really was. Um, you just turn it up to one. It had four 12-inch speakers in it. It was 120 watts. I mean, this thing would just jam, man. It, was just, it would blow your face off. You just turn it up to one, the volume. It was loud enough. You know, you didn't need to turn up any louder. It would just make your head vibrate a little bit. Well, once in a while, when nobody was around, I turned that sucker up to 10. It's like, I'm just going to feel it now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into it because I was trying to be a rock star, you know, and uh, I had long hair, stick on tattoos once in a while. Um, didn't make it, obviously. God had other plans for my life. But, um, but I'd just wail into that thing. I'd do the head banging. I'd just hit it. And, you know, everything would begin to shake. The windows would shake. The walls would shake. And it's like you could hear me probably a mile away playing and wailing that thing. I just, I just loved it. Just cranked up the volume. Now I probably wouldn't be able to do that. But at the time, it was fun. Begin to shake everything. I think when we walk in a greater unity, there is a greater power that is released. When we walk in a greater unity with one another, there is a greater power that is released. I think hell begins to shake. Supernatural things begin to happen that eyes have never seen before, ears have never heard, that minds never imagined before. Things begin to be released when we create a unity of atmosphere. There's a power of God that is released. I think there's an atmosphere that's created when we walk in this unity that when people walk maybe into this place, they don't, maybe if they're struggling with an addiction, they don't even have to be, have hands laid upon them, but they just get instantly healed by the power of God, set free from addiction. When they walk, they get hit with the power of God. They don't need a 12-month rehab program or a 12-step program, but they get touched by the power of God and get instantly set free. I think when we create this atmosphere of unity, maybe cancer begins to flee and leave. I don't know about you, but I I hate cancer. I want it to be destroyed. I want people to be set free of it. I think the power of God is released when we begin to walk in a greater sense of unity. There's a power in it that's released. And we talk about unity. Unity, when it's used in a positive way, has power. But also when it's used in a negative way, it has a toxic effect. Unity is, is neutral. You give it a direction. It can either be shot into a positive direction or into a, a negative direction. Unity is neutral. We can either choose for it to be something beneficial or something detrimental with unity. You look at the Bible in the New Testament, we can look at some examples. You see Herod and Pilate. They were once bitter enemies. They hated each other. But all of a sudden, Jesus comes along, 
And they were like, you know what, we need to take out this guy. So they had a plot. They came together, and they became best of friends to take out Jesus over a negative work. They used unity in a negative direction. I don't know about you, but I've kind of seen this from time to time, but when people get offended, they tend to find each other. It's really weird. I mean, people t- tend to find each other. It's like they have a honing device. You know, it's like they're putting out a signal. It's like, I'm offended, I'm offended, you're offended, let's find each other. And they find each other where you are. And it doesn't matter if it's a 4-H or the church or a club, just, just people offended just tend to find each other. It's just crazy how it works out that way. They find one another and they kind of unite and they maybe never even talked to each other before, weren't even friends, but now they're best of friends because they're both offended using unity in a negative way. But Paul and Silas is uh, another example. They experienced unity in a a positive way, in a different way. They were thrown in jail, in prison, and Silas hadn't been with Paul that long, and he could have complained and said, you know what, I just started hanging around with you and all of a sudden we get thrown in jail. I'm I'm done with this, man. I'm just start complaining. It's like, I'm better off without you right now. Look what you did to me. But he's like, you know what? We're not going to get divided over this. You know, if we're going to overcome, we're going to overcome together. If we're going to get out of this, we're going to get out of this together. Paul, if you're going to sing, I'm going to sing. If you're going to shout, I'm going to shout. And that's what they begin to do. They begin to get in unity. They begin to praise God. And the miraculous begin to happen when prison doors begin to open. And they're miraculously set free because they got in unity and agreement and begin to praise God together. It's in that place that God opens the miraculous doors. God gives us an example in Genesis 11. We're going to read that real quick here. Genesis 11.1, 1, if you want to open up there. He gives us an illustration of a people that shows their motivation, that get in unity. It's actually the Tower of Babel. It's in Genesis 11.1, 1, we're going to read this. It says, Now the whole earth had one speech, One language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to the city and the tower which the sons of men built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are gone. And they all have all one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. He gives us an illustration of a people that get unified to build this tower towards heaven. And he makes this statement. He says, whatever they set out to do, they're in unity, speaking the same thing. There's, there's nothing that they cannot do. There's nothing that they cannot accomplish because they're in unity. And God makes a blanket statement. That's true for anything when you're in unity. It's true for a husband and a wife. And they get in agreement with one another and they begin to focus on the same things and begin to dream about the same things and think and say the same things. There's nothing that's impossible for them when they come in unity and agreement with one another. It's the same thing for like a business. There's nothing that could be impossible for a business if people get in alignment, begin to dream, begin to speak, begin to think the same things. There's nothing impossible for them. That's what he was saying. It was a blanket statement. The same thing with the body of Christ. There's there's nothing impossible for us. God didn't say I need 10,000 people or or 1,000 people. He said just give me a few people that are in agreement and unity with one another. Watch what I do with them. The sky is the limit. I don't need 10,000. I don't need 1,000. I just need a few that come in agreement and come in unity with one another. And you watch what I do through them. There's nothing that we cannot do, that we cannot accomplish when we're walking with unity with one another. And Jesus actually prayed for unity in John 17, 20. He said this, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you have Gave me that they may be one as we are one, I and them, and you and me, so they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know you sent me and have loved me, loved them even as you have loved me. And Jesus is praying that we come to this complete unity with Him and with one another. And He says, when they'll know that the that the, He has sent us because of what He's done and the unity that we're walking with one another, the world will know that He has sent Jesus and sent us. 
He prayed for unity. He, he, God values unity. There's, va- uh, there's unity in the Godhead between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God values unity. It's all laced throughout the whole Bible. And we're called to value the same thing, to value unity. And we read the scripture in Psalms, in Psalms 133. It gives us this picture of people in unity. There's this people that they're actually in Israel. They're in the lowlands and the valleys. And every year they have to go up to the, the Mount Zion to, for a feast to, to worship God. And once they're in this valley and these lowlands, they begin to sing psalms. They actually begin to sing psalms 120 through 134. There's 15 psalms they begin to sing. As they go up to the Mount Zion, up, up the, the mountain to worship God, they begin to sing these psalms. And the closer they got, when they began to see the temple of God, the house of God, they began to sing this song. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. They began to sing that song once they came closer to the the house of God because there was a mix. There was a a mix of different people, of blending. There was not just people just from their their neighborhood or their back back. Uh, door or from their uh, community, but there's people from Africa, from, from the Middle East, from all over the place that came to worship God together. It gives us this beautiful picture of people coming into unity. And they said, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's a beautiful picture. That is the kingdom. It's every tribe, every nation, every tongue coming together to worship God with with one another. There's no division. There's no the Methodist church, the First Baptist church, or the church of God, the assembly of God. This is everybody coming together for one purpose, to worship God. And it gives us this picture of what it looks like to be in unity And he uses this word, he says, behold. This word behold, we don't use in our English language today. It's not something we use. We don't say, behold, there's a sale at Kohl's today. It's not not a word that we use very often uh, at all. So, um, but this word behold, he puts it in there. It basically means it says, this is important. You need to gaze upon this. This is not the norm. You need to look carefully at this because this is something that's not the norm. And he uses how good and pleasant. He uses two words before that. He didn't just say how good is unity or how pleasant is unity, but he uses two words before that. He says how good and how pleasant it is. Basically what he's saying, it's inexhaustible. You can't comprehend how really good it is to be in unity with one another, what it's really like and what it is to experience such unity. It's inexhaustible what it is to be in unity. And when you come to that place, maybe unity and and a place of um, your marriage, you're like, man, I didn't know it could be this good before. I didn't know that life could be this pleasant or family could be this good or or it could be this pleasant. Or maybe it's in a place of business or a workplace. It's like, I didn't know it could be this good or be this pleasant. It's like, we don't understand maybe how good it is. I don't think we scratch the surface of what it's like to be in real unity with one another. And it says there that the Lord commanded a blessing. Life evermore. There's a command of blessing and unity, of favor, blessing, and power. And that's where I want to be at, being in unity. There's a commanded blessing. If you keep strife and discord out of the front door of your house, there's going to be a blessing in your house, of favor, and the power of God working in your life. So asking the question, what establishes unity? What is the criteria that establishes unity. I think when we look at unity, it's, it's not something where we just have uh, common ground or we just, just agree on certain things or we're working through a set of papers and agreeing to a certain statement because that's uniformity. But it's unity is a product of the Spirit. The Spirit of God creates unity. He's the one that brings us together. It's his spirit in you and his spirit in me that brings us together. It's a product of the spirit. Unity is not something that we create. It is something that he creates. Because there's one spirit. There's one baptism. There's one faith. There's one Lord. And there's one Father of all. He creates unity. We don't create unity. The spirit creates unity in such a way I can't walk away from you. Because we're We are united together in the Spirit. We have a common father and a common elder brother. We've been baptized 
and the body, we are one. Even when we don't agree, we can't walk away from each other because, I mean, I understand what you're thinking or or your head, but I understand your heart and, and I know who you are and we're called to each other with one another. Can't walk away from one another. We are united by the Spirit of God. He's the one that creates unity. But it is our responsibility to guard unity, to protect it, to keep it, to nurture it. That is our responsibility. It is not God's responsibility to protect it, to keep it, to guard it, to nurture it. That is our responsibility to keep that atmosphere of unity. It says this in Ephesians 4, 3. It says, I want you to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. I want you to endeavor to keep the unity of spirit and the bond of peace. That's what he talks about there. Some translations say it's eager to maintain or being diligent to preserve. And the word endeavor comes from a root word that means to use speed. It means to make diligent effort, to be prompt or earnest. It means to give every effort, labor. The word keep means to guard from loss or injury properly by keeping the eye upon, figuratively to fulfill a command is elsewhere translated as hold fast, watch and preserve. That we make a diligent effort to guard it and to keep it, to labor, that this is something we value, this is something that is important, this is something that's our responsibility that we maintain this atmosphere of unity. God doesn't create, he, God creates unity, but we are the ones that are to protect it and to nurture it and to guard it. The word bond indicates a cementing or gluing. That's what it indicates. It's a desire of peace is the glue that gives us the ability to maintain unity it's through the bond of peace. I think oftentimes we're wired to appease people. It's to appease a situation. But not often in doing that, we don't really take care of the problem. But we're called to be peacemakers. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We're called to be peacemakers, that we, we work through an issue until there's a solution that comes forth from it. Because we're guarding, we're keeping discord and strife out of the door. We're bringing forth peace in the situation. We're called to be peacemakers. And when we get with one another, when we seek God together, Jesus together, the more we get closer to him, the closer we get to one another. We begin to work out issues and and conflict when we seek him together and we pray together. It's harder to keep offenses and bitterness and anger towards somebody when you pray with them with, towards Jesus, when you seek them together. That can't stay. It's like, I just I can't hold on to this anymore. When we seek God together, we get closer to him and to one another. We're called to be peacemakers. That means I've got to be long-suffering. I've got to walk in humility. I've got to walk in kindness. I've got to walk in mercy. I've got to react with love, the nature of Christ. That's what it requires of me to be selfless, to be slow to, to speak and quick to listen, slow to anger, that I take on that nature to be a peacemaker. I think it's one of the greatest things that we can be is be a peacemaker, for you shall be called the children of God. That's what the scripture says. Because Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples, not based upon when you gather, what you believe, your worship styles, but they'll know you're my disciples for the love that you have for one another. They'll know that you are mine because of the love that you have for one another, that we react with love. That's how the world will know that we are his. It says this in Romans 15. It says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude and mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ having the same attitude and mind toward each other in Christ. It's basically saying how Jesus treats you, you you treat one another. How Jesus thinks about you, you think about one another. How Jesus loves you, you love one another. You have that same mind, that same attitude, and when you do, you're going to glorify God who is in heaven. So we're called to protect, to guard, to keep unity, the spirit of unity. We are, that is our responsibility. That is not God's responsibility. He creates in you, but it's our responsibility to guard it, to keep it, to nurture it diligently, to create that 
atmosphere of unity where God's favor and blessing and power rest in our midst. Just a couple things to remember when we're talking about keeping the spirit of unity is that we have one enemy, and it's not the person sitting next to you today. It's not your husband or wife. It's not your grandma or grandpa, your aunt or uncle, your brother or sister, your kids. It's not the church that you got offended at, your enemy. And if that is your focus, if that's your enemy, then you're going to be in disunity and disarray. Because that is what the enemy wants to do, is bring separation, to bring division. That is his goal. If we can get divided, he can keep us from being united and accomplishing what God has for us. He wants to kill the, the power of unity because he knows if we are united, we are an unstoppable force for the kingdom of God. So he'll do everything in his power to keep us divided, separated, for us to take offenses, to hold on to bitterness, anything he can do to keep us from walking in unity. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and rulers of darkness. It's not a battle of flesh and blood. You have one enemy, and that is the devil. That's who we're wrestling against. The Bible says that a house divided cannot stand. A house divided against itself cannot stand. That's talking about maybe a, a national house, a natural house, a church house, any house. A house divided against itself cannot stand. You know, the greatest threat to America today, our nation, is not Al-Qaeda, it's not ISIS, it's not the Russians, but it's when one man pits himself against another man, when there's this internal conflict and division within our country, that's what can bring our nation down from the inside, because a house divided against itself cannot stand. What can bring down a church house is not demonic forces, because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But what can bring down a church house is when people get in division, have discord and strife with one another and there's separation, that can bring down a church house because a house divided against itself cannot stand. It's the enemy of your soul wants to bring separation and division. You know, the, the first murder on the planet of earth was not against a stranger. It was against a brother. It was attack on brotherhood. Because he knew if I can get brother to rise up against brother and sister to rise up against sister and brother against sister, I can, I can destroy what's trying to be built. If I can bring separation and division and schisms with, between these people, now I can stop what's trying to be built. The first murder on the planet of Earth wasn't a stranger, but it was a brother. He tries to separate husbands and wives, parents and children. He tries to separate us with political parties, with the Republican or Democrat. He tries to separate us with worship styles, the way we worship, or the time we start church. I've seen crazy stuff happen when I was growing up in church. I mean, people, we almost had a church split over changing the piano to a clavinova. It was that crazy. The church about split right down the center because everybody was upset that we're taking out this old, untuned piano. It's been there since probably like 1900, and we're replacing it with a clavinova. Almost a church split. I remember we always had a church split. Everybody was mad at each other when we wanted to expand the choir uh, area and make the, the altar thing come out further, and it was just this wooden piece that was up in front of the stage. They wanted to move that out to make more space for the choir but some people got upset. It was kind of loose and wobbly. That's why they wanted to replace it. Somebody came in and just nailed that thing down with 100 nails one night. It's like, that's not happening. It's crazy stuff. Can't make it up. We get upset over carpet and paint colors and worship styles and all these things. We're missing the purpose of why we're really here and what we're trying to accomplish over petty stuff. We get offended over stupid things. It's crazy. He wants to separate us gender-wise, generationally, young people, old people. Young people, you need older people today. They have things that they've weathered and been through the storms of life that they can impart into you with wisdom, things that they can share to you that you need. And older people, you need young people too. I know you may not do 100 selfies to get the best picture, 
you know, may not do Twitter or understand the language, like I can't even, all that stuff. But we need young people too. We're not a young person church or an old person church. We're a multi-generational church, a multi-generational people. Let's not fall for that young church, old church thing. We're a multi-generational church. We need one another. Let's not fall for that. We need each other. It tries to bring separation and division through all these things. Between the local church, tries to bring separation. I think we've been called, I don't know how many different things. We've been called an occult. We've been called, had a smoking room. A lot of things, crazy things said about us. But let's not be that kind of people that put down other churches or other ministries or get a religious pride that we can do sometimes. And I, I kind of fell on that a few times. Like, man, I've, once I got the Holy Ghost, like, you don't have the Holy Ghost, man. You got nothing, man. You get this religious pride built up in you. It's like, well, you're just barely saved, aren't you? <laughs> you get this pride built up in, in you, and it's like you look down on everybody else. And let's not be that. It's a different expression. Let's be for other ministries, other people, other movements. If we're going to err on one side, let's err on that side. There might be things that might be an error, but we won't, you know, we'll call those things out. But let's err on the side of being for one another, being for other ministries, other churches, other movements. Let's be that kind of people, not put down other ch churches in our community, in our region, in our area, because he tries to bring division, he tries to keep us out of unity with one another. That is his plot. That's his scheme. That's his tactic. He tries to do, and we're aware of that. We're able to guard and not let him accomplish that, to keep strife and discord out of the front door of our lives. You know, I think we're called to one purpose. I could sum it up to this, that we're called to glorify God, to give him glory. And when we keep that in focus, in the front of our mind, that I'm here to bring him glory. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm just a part of something greater in the kingdom of God. I want to see his kingdom advance in the world around me. I'm just glad I get to be a part of something greater than myself, that his name would be glorified and that his world would become this world, his kingdom would be advanced to the world around us, that, that we become a pointer for Christ, that we reflect people to him and point to Christ and the Father and his goodness and his love. We become a, a sample that people in taste and see that the Lord is good, that people get a taste of that, that we become an invitation. We become an invitation to invite people to Christ. And I'm just here to bring him glory. If we all have that mentality, we're just here to bring him glory. We want, we want what he wants. We're not building just around just a Sunday morning message or a worship, but it's so much deeper than that that we live through the expression of our faith through the kingdom, not just on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday as a people of God and we have that mentality what can we not accomplish we're unstoppable people and the enemy knows that when we unite we become unstoppable there's nothing he can do to stop us and we begin to shake hell and hell begins to tremble when we walk together and say you know what we're walking together to see him glorified today we want to see his name lifted up we want to see his kingdom advance in our community in our region in our nation when we walk together with that purpose in mind you cannot stop us we may have our differences but we're united together in the spirit of God he creates that unity. And I want to be that kind of people where we're focused. We have that one purpose of seeing his name glorified. What can we not do? What can we not accomplish as a united people? When we walk together in unity, there's nothing that we cannot accomplish with one another. There's nothing we cannot do. And I want to see hell shaken in our community, in our region, in our nation that we see the bigger picture and the grander scheme of things, that, that we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. And it's such an awesome thing to be a part of something like that. What can we not do together? What can we not accomplish being united together, walking in unity with one another? I pray that we'd be that kind of people that would endeavor to, to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, that we'd all have that mentality, that we'd all walk that way in our homes, in this place, wherever we are, that we keep the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. You watch what God does when we create that atmosphere of unity, a blessing, of favor, a power, 
uh, that's released in our lives. So I just want to pray for us this morning. Thank you.